am Professor Phil Stinson from the Department of Classics. And I'd like to welcome all of you to this afternoon's uh, faculty seminar in Digital Humanities. This is the third of uh, four planned uh, seminars this semester. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce to you uh, Mark Rainey from uh, the Department of Theater. I think probably most of you know him. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, but in the event that um, um, there's someone who doesn't know him, I will introduce him and, and, and uh, say a few things about his, his experiences and his work here at uh, KU. Um, as I said, Mark is professor, uh, he's head of design as well in the Department of Theater here at KU. He received his MFA in scenic design from University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has taught uh, at the University of Tulsa. Uh, then he joined the KU faculty here uh, in 1987. Uh, Mark's uh, institute or center, IE VR, or that is VR, um, is uh, housed in the, in, in the University Theater and in the Department of Theater here at KU. And the mission of IE VR uh, is to explore the uses of digital media, virtual reality, and related technologies in theater production and performance. He has a number of generous and well-known sponsors from the digital industry, such as uh, NVIDIA, uh, as well as others. And since the mid-1990s, uh, Professor Rainey and his colleagues have staged a number of digitally innovative works and performances, including uh, The Adding Machine, <coughs> Play, Wings, Tesla Electric, um, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Dinosaurs, The Magic Flute, uh, The Tree of Life, and most recently, Adding Machine, The Musical, um, which uh, was uh, put on in, in the fall of 2013. So it's a pleasure to introduce Mark Rainey to you this afternoon. Murphy Hall meets here. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming. Thanks for the Hall Center for inviting me over. Um, yeah, this is a, a series. I believe the next one is November 17th? Uh, 19th. 19th. Yes. OK. So uh, I'll, I'll probably be here. Um, yeah, uh, virtual reality in the theater is kind of an odd mix, but, but not if you think about it. In some ways, theater has always been virtual reality. It's creating an artificial reality that exists for a, a given point of time, and then it disappears when you're done with it, and then later reconstitute it again, just like you do in a video game, right? Or any other kind of interactive, you know, uh, walkthrough with, for architecture or anything like that. It's, it's all a type of, well, as my friend Ron Willis would say, everything is theater if you stand back far enough. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the idea uh, is basically that theater uh, evolves. It always evolves. And it, it should evolve. And it hasn't been evolving very fast for a while. Okay? We've been kind of stuck in the same kind of stagecraft that we've been using for the last hundred years. Uh, maybe building flats out of wood, cardboard and canvas and, and, and plywood and, and paint. And we have a modern audience, we have people nowadays that get all of their information through digital media. My 85 year old mother has a smartphone and she can, she's down with it, she can work that thing. And a tablet and a laptop and, and uh, <coughs> go to the movies and it's all digitally created. Uh, the television shows that we watch are all digitally shot, digitally edited, the commercials are, are incredible for commercials. Um, so, yeah, theater has a tendency to stand back and say, we're all above that. We don't do that sort of thing. Where does that get us, right? Mm -hmm. Theater absorbs everything else, why not absorb that too? Okay. Um, <coughs> When Robert Evan Jones was lecturing going around the country talking about the new theater that he wanted to envision and, and, and build, one of the things he talked about 
uh, was incorporating a film with theater. And uh, that was the high technology of his time, right? And he did some experiments with that, and other people have done many. There's been many experiments with combining film and theater. And uh, that's all to the good, and pointed the way towards some new ideas. Uh, and now that we have digital information, uh, digital ways of creating pictures, we can go that a step further. Now this all started here at KU, innocently enough, when I was designing a production of uh, Speak Our Name Desire with Jack Wright. And I built a little cardboard model and did all the stuff that designers are supposed to do. And since I was on the side playing around with computer modeling, I said, I'll just make a little model of that set on my computer. But what if I printed that out on the transparency and put it in one of those old overhead projectors and shown it on the, on the stage, and then I could sit in the audience and see what it looked like? That looked pretty good. Yeah. It looked like it was supposed to look. It was big, it was took up the space. And then I thought, well, what if I, I have this little bit of arcane knowledge, what if I took two of them from slightly different angles? Put polarized filters over the two over the two projectors, and then sat in the audience with my 3D glasses. <laughs> wow, that was really something. Then this little voice in the back of my head said, "Why don't you just do a show that way sometime?" Now you can go two ways with that. You can take it as a moral imperative and go ahead and do the shows. Or you can go to psychotherapy and try to get rid of the voices. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the time I wish I had opted for B. <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, we went ahead and we started working and, and uh, we had no idea what we were doing. The first show that we did was Adding Machine. Uh, again with uh, Ron Willis as the director. And we formed a class around it so that we could all get together in the afternoons and, and play with the technology that we didn't know it was going to work. We borrowed things from everywhere. Um, I took delivery of some software in a parking lot in North Lawrence. Some <laughs> Alpha software that wasn't supposed to be out of the factory. It was all very strange. Uh, and uh, we, we, I think one of the uh, hallmarks of Real experimental theater is just, you don't know what it's going to look like at the end, you know, which leaves a certain amount of room for failure. So there's always some stuff that doesn't work. It seems like in every production that we've tried, and some stuff that does work, and and, and we often learn as much or more from the things that didn't work the way we expected than, than from the things that we were really happy with. And I've written articles about uh, just about every show that we've done. And I've, the best articles and the best uh, scholarship, really, that came out of it was uh, usually describing what didn't work and, and why it did. But luckily, the, those, we've, we've gotten those moments fewer and farther apart now. Um, but we've got to be careful of getting blasé and, and, and boring with the whole thing. Uh, here's some clips from Adding Machine way back when. Um, You're a professor who created nine virtual worlds for this production of The Adding Machine. What a lot of people don't understand is that there are a lot of facets to virtual reality. It's not just putting on a helmet and seeing a world that you're not in at the moment. And we're going to show people a new one with this production. The 1923 play was written by Elmer Rice. It's the story of Mr. Zero, a store accountant who is replaced by an adding machine. Zero's inability to accept new technology kills him, but new computer technology helps tell this story. <laughs> My name's Zero, and I'm a murderer. A computer projects dual images onto a 234 square foot screen. To the naked eye, the scene is blurred. The audience will wear polarized glasses for the three dimensional effect. As I started to carve the leg of lamb, have you 
Never carved a leg of lamb. No, what? Corned beef was more aspid. Very difficult on account of the bone. And the adding machine is the perfect choice to show off this technology, says director Ron Willis. One of the wonderful things that Mark has come up with is the virtual reality possibility that he can transmute the settings to reflect not just the external reality, but the reality of the character's models. And so the VR, virtual reality, and the adding machine are a happy combination in that regard. During the performance, a backstage computer operator will guide the audience through each virtual world. Taking cues from the actors on stage, the operator makes real-time decisions about what parts of the world the audience sees. Then at the meeting, the virtual world has been pre-recorded, so no two shows will look the same. That would seriously disappoint me if this just came out as another way of doing a backdrop for a show. For the actors, the play presents a unique challenge, working with projections they can't put in focus. You kind of have to look at the screen through the corner of your eye and figure out which way another character on the screen is looking at you, or, or you have to know where the bed is on the screen so that you can go and lay down on it when it's not really there. Be Bean has used virtual down. reality technology to design sets for several key productions. This is the first attempt, he says, to incorporate virtual reality into a live theatrical performance. Up to now, it's been a matter of dollars and cents. Virtual reality technology has been so expensive that the only people who can afford to dabble in it are the people who saw money coming out the other end. Perhaps now it's just getting to the point where you need to support to do it. So somebody at the first we want it's Kansas. Over. Do you think that this is the end? Yeah, so uh, the main difference between what Robin and Jones had envisioned with this movie and what we have envisioned is that our stuff is live. I mean, it, you move around it, it's not preset, it's not pre recorded. <coughs> Uh, with the Robert Edgar Jones model, the actors have to act around the movie because the movie can't change. If they decide to take longer with a line or skip a line or do whatever they want to do or run to the other side of the stage, everything stops because it no longer is in sync. With virtual reality, it keeps that live aspect of theater, that, that live presence that, that makes uh, life theater unique, I guess. Okay, so you can have, you can have the best of both worlds. Uh, here's some pictures from uh, Adding Machine. Zero uh, on, is up front. The boss is backstage in front of a camera uh, being projected. And of course, he's, he's overpowering Zero. And then at the end of the speech, he's really overpowering Zero. Um, and just before he fires him and, and things go to hell. Um, we found we, all kinds of interesting things. We, we discovered that you can make shadows of the people. The shadows of the characters weren't real shadows. Those were other actors behind the screen. So the shadows were doing other things than the people were doing. Mm -hmm. and, and just all by accident, just walking around and keeping your eyes open. Uh, the, the jury scene with a little $2 uh, novelty uh, mirror. We, put in front of the camera. Um, and then there's this, this interesting idea of presenting one reality on the screen and another reality in front of you. Uh, it, and we're still messing around with that. We've we messed around with that in almost every show. It, it's that, that this playing around with the idea of presence. What's real and what's not real. Um, so we see the coffin is behind him, but he's coming out of the coffin. and. Uh, doesn't seem to bother anybody. Everybody knows what's going on. Um, and the, the, the crowd scene and the piano's floating and the door is floating in the air and stuff like that. We did have one virtual character just to see if we could. Um, virtual characters are not very interesting to me because they're, they're, they're very uh, wooden and they, they don't do much. But this guy had two lines. So we put him in there for his two lines, and, and he, he got such a huge laugh that nobody heard the two lines. <laughs> 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 um, and then uh, Zero, of course, the famous last scene at the end where he's at the giant uh, adding machine. All right, moving on, we decided to up 
the rent for everything, you know, all of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Kathy. There's Dennis <laughs> over there. Mm -hmm. Del. Um, rather than just settle for the little 3D glasses, which are very handy, these are uh, full mount, head mounted displays, television sets in front of each eyeball. Um, which you can see through. So you can see through the TV screen and see the actors in front of you, but at the same time, the videos are being bounced right in front of your eyes. Uh, this is for the, the show Wings, and if you remember Wings, the, the woman has a stroke, okay? Uh, we figured we could give the entire audience a stroke. Uh, <laughs> and so we, we went for it. <laughs> Times bold in forms of entertainment. Well, the high tech world of virtual reality is one of the youngest. The KU Theater Department is one of the first in the nation to combine both. 27 Steve Walker reports. Who was the first president of the United States? Washington. The play Wings is about Emily Stilson, a former stunt pilot who suffers a stroke in her 70s and is plunged into a disoriented world. Doctors don't seem to understand her, but the audience does. With the help of these special virtual reality goggles, theater goers can experience up to four levels of the woman's reality at once. The units are capable of displaying two and three dimensional objects in full color on the lens, plus stereo sound. Quite a leap from those cheesy 3D glasses of the 1950s. Superimposing the electronic world over the real world with the actors moving in front of you. And the audience can move their heads around and put the images kind of where they want them. And Mark helped develop this amazing technology and then integrated it into the stage production. Quite a challenge for actress Jennifer Nichols of Topeka, who plays Emily. It's interesting. You see people's heads going all different ways, and you know that they're seeing really interesting stuff in their glasses. I think the challenge is the same with any play, because the virtual reality doesn't affect me near as much as it affects the audience and the director and the people who have to do all the computer stuff. I just Ronald Willis, K professor of theater, holds the distinction of being one of the first in the nation to direct a virtual reality play. Uh, as far as I know, though, we're, as, we're as far in the vanguard as anybody in doing established scripts for live audiences, making use of the technology and the traditional theatrical trappings. Now, don't rush to the box office for tickets because Wings is completely sold out. But don't despair. Another virtual reality production is slated for next year. Steve Walker, 27 News, Lawrence. KU's virtual reality productions have sparked world, worldwide interest. Australia, France, and the Netherlands have all sent representatives to watch them. So, yeah, uh, as she goes through these things, these abstract shapes, pictures of the hospital rooms, of the doctors that are moving over her, uh, are all appearing in the audience's headsets, right? Sure. Well, I just think that there's maybe one comment that might be important, and that is that when you experience, when I was watching this stuff back, back in the day, in these images, some of the, the stuff that's coming out of the virtual reality technology looks like that they're behind these people. Mm -hmm. But when you were, but in the show, it looks like they're, they're, the people are in the midst of them. So, so the images aren't behind them. Right. And, right. and that's, in some cases, that's well, not captured by these. Well, you can. And, and, we did, and we didn't stop there because we also hung projectors from the front, shooting at the screens behind the actors, sure. yeah. and then had a little area behind a, a scrim that could let yeah. We did everything. It was a mess. We had, <laughs> we had, we had so many operators in the, in, the upper, in the booth upstairs, we had to put in a second row of seating. So, yeah. we put in, so there was the first, the first row had about six people, then we put in some risers, and the top row had another six people or so back there. Uh, and it was, it was crazy. And poor Alex had to wire all of these headsets and make them all work. And yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was what I, I loved. I loved sitting in the audience, or sitting out in the lobby, and watching people come out after the show. And just, they would just get red imprint on their foreheads. <laughs> Goggles and depressing, and they were just dazed. It was, it was wonderful. Uh, and at the end, uh, you know, the final image is she's Owen Walker, and she's flying away, and we don't know what's happening to her at that point. 
Um, then we decided to do something completely different and went for a much uh, a different software, a different way of rendering images, and we connected with a, a, a professor up in uh, architectural engineering who was an expert at rendering lighting sources. Uh, this is a scene from uh, Edison, Thomas Edison's workshop in the, in the play Tesla Electric. And we took three screen, three rear projection screens and seen them together. So it made a full panorama in front of you, 120 degrees. And then three sets of projectors behind, all in stereo, so they were all three-dimensional in the audience, four 3D glasses, the, the sunglasses, um, with these highly realistic, highly rendered um, scenes. And uh, there's an example of how, he re how this uh, Professor Moik uh, rendered them with each, each light source separately and then gang them all together. Um, and th the effect was startling in, in the way it made you feel you were in this other place, Tom Edison's workroom, for example. Um, but in the end, I found it kind of disappointing. Uh, because it was just so realistic. And, okay. <laughs> so, so what? Um, there were a couple of scenes. I'll show them to you here. There's, there's the uh, workbench and they're, they're, they're puttering around with lights. We did have some special effects flashing from behind the screen. Um, there's the patent office where Thomas Edison is patenting the electric chair.
you can see here that we're using the virtual reality really to crawl inside the head of the character, mm -hmm. not to, to depict any, and we learned that lesson in Tesla Electric. We're not worried about making sense. This is all psychological, okay? You saw how she was, she was talking and, and, and pictures of her mother are floating by behind her head and, and in, this, in this scene here she's in the, she's in the uh, trial and the trial is filled with all of these metal spikes and things that are aimed at her and this giant uh, scale that's moving up and down and, and on either side you can see uh, the face of the um, lawyer up there and the lawyer himself is right down below. Okay, uh, so we, we get this, and the crew member that's filming the lawyer is visible, right? So we see the, this this idea of, of presence. You know, what's what are we supposed to pay attention to, and, and, and what what is the overall effect? And, uh, I th I think that I was much happier with. Uh, most of this show uh, than I was with things that came before, it, even though we, we crowded it all into our smaller theater. Um, I went to England and did Midsummer Night's Dream, and uh, it was a very interesting experience. I thought that they were going to skin me alive for burying you know, for doing what I was about to do to Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, but they were all for it. And anything you can do to Shakespeare over there, they're all for it. You know, they've seen it all. Uh, I, think, I think sometimes the best theater is done by people who are bored. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Get bored first and then go do theater. Um, there's the scene in the washroom, the ladies' washroom, when they're planning their escape into the forest. And the forest isn't a forest. The forest is a computer generated, it's, it's a computer land. Every part of the forest is a different part of, of computerness. Uh, they're all a bunch of geeks who work at this company. And uh, this uh, is the, this uh, part of the forest is a paint program. That's awesome. Um, and this part of the forest, uh, uh, Tanya's Bauer, is a word processing program. And all these all these Shakespearean words are sort of gently falling like leaves uh, all around her. Um, To you, our minds we will unfold. Tomorrow night, when Phoebe doth behold her silver visage in the watering glass, decking with liquid no. pearl the plaguy cross, a time that loves fights must still be still. Lost in the world wide web, there. Any of the woods where often you and I, pulling from those beds for one tonight, emptying our bosoms of their counsel sweet, there my the sun and myself shall meet, and then from Athens turn away our eyes to seek new friends and stranger company. Farewell, sweet play fellow. Donkey head. Pray thou fast, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep working, Sandra. We must start our sight with love's fruit tomorrow. Do you get it? I will, my Hermia. Fuck this sort of a sandra, Father. Let you. As you on him, Demetrius dotes on you. Ah, I'm in the basement. If we shadows have offended, Think that this and all is mended. That you have but slumbered here, while these visions did appear. And this weak and idle thing, no more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend. If your pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest man, if we have unearned luck, now to escape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends then. As the fuck and I am. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. Software to something it was never meant to do, which is puppets. Uh -huh. 
dinosaur puppets, right? And uh, the, the story is that these, these excavator, these surveyors go down underground and find this world of dinosaurs. And so we had, um, see the guy in the front in the purple jumpsuit, whatever that is, uh, he's the dinosaur. And behind him is his dinosaur self. Uh -huh. So again, we're playing off that idea of presence, of what's, what's the real thing here and what's the mediated thing. Kids had no trouble at all putting those two ideas together, yeah. not a bit. And they just laughed and laughed. Mm -hmm. And I would sit, I'd go sit in the back for every performance. I didn't miss a single performance. Because my, my daughter was there. Yeah. She was just this day. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there's the, the, the dinosaur fight getting ready to happen.
conjuring up animals with the magic flute. And there was a wagon that rolled out with the, the sprite, the heavenly spirits on top, and, and a rain cloud giving rain, and the, and the wagon had a projection screen on it.
Oh, no. 
YouTube, you can, you can watch the whole thing. Uh, it's like 10 minutes long. Um, I, 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 hmm. I, was, I was pretty happy with the way it turned out, uh, all, all told. I would, I would like to see the ones with just all of the, all of the acting light just turned off completely and just go straight with the projector out and see what that would have done. I think we're really interesting. We have frustrated the audience somewhat, but we don't do it necessarily. <laughs> we do it for ourselves. Um, so there. Uh, that's, that brings us up to date. And now we've got time to chat. Software that um, the software that you most recently used um, able to open your files from the mid 1990s, or have you had to um, kind of an archival question too? Um, are those? Can you open your your, your working files from, so. from way back in the mid 1990s? I don't think so. The operating yeah. systems have changed so many times from Mac OS 9 or whatever it was that we were using back yeah. back when we first started. That, uh, modern. So somebody really clever could probably figure it out, but but you know, I have no idea. I still have them all on, on some on floppies, <laughs> <laughs> floppy drives. You know. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, it's. Uh, come a long way, and we've, we've been real thankful uh, and been real grateful to the companies that didn't need to help us at all. That why not? We're, we're, we're harmless, you know. We asked them for some free equipment or some free software or some free whatever, and they usually say yes. You know, people people are afraid to ask, but and and you. you can say something like, well, I'll write a review of your software or whatever, or I'll publish it in an article or something. They don't much care about that. They, 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 they just don't give it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Where do you um, see the technology going from here? What kind of things, where do you want to take, take things going forward? Well, I've proposed another production for next year, the year after, whatever, uh, for, for the University Theater. Uh, I'm really in, interested in this idea of, of uh, presence, stage presence, um, uh, and, and, and what that means. And we've got this whole new aesthetic uh, in concerts uh, where you go and, 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 and they're there singing in front of you, but they're also on a big screen. And who, who's, and, and sometimes you see people in the very front row watching the screen, <laughs> right? 
and, and you'll see people in the back row watching the live actors who are just the size of ants. And, and it's, you know, what is it that's uh, attractive and, and, and makes that happen? Uh, a lot of uh, professors who lecture in front of large uh, halls I've talked to uh, over in Munich and things like that. And they'll notice that, that nobody will take any notes on what they're saying unless they put it on the screen. Then all of a sudden everybody thinks it's important and they start writing it down. Right? Once it's mediated, it takes on a different, a different stance, uh, a different standing in, in, in can't understand, I don't understand it. Why not? So I've got, some, I've got some ideas of having live actors and their mediated versions and, and you know, on stage. And more experimentation. Yeah. Like I said, you never, you never really know what's going to happen until you, until you try it. And then you have to be kind of flexible. Luckily, rehearsal. Rehearsal process smooths a lot of things out. Things may look a lot different. You, you have a machine. Uh, things looked a lot different the last dress rehearsal compared to the first dress rehearsal. Mm -hmm. As it should be. I was trying to kind of relate some of what you're doing to other things um, I'm aware of in digital humanities and historical studies. And the two things came to mind. One was kind of alluded to is in, in building no more about this, but 3D historical reconstructions which really capture, you know, the light. You can see what a building looked like, you know, in the summer versus the winter or at night versus today. And you know, it's getting much more and more accurate. Um, and then the other so I, I don't I don't know if, uh, how these might relate to your use the other one is also, I don't know what I call it, this idea of uh, looking at glitches, so, um, or software, in software studies. Um, so a glitch might be, um, like in a digitized book, if you see somebody's, you know, with the thumbs that they didn't get out of the way of, of, of the scanner. Um, and so looking at glitches as a way to, um, not as necessarily mistakes, but uh, signs that um, allow, allow an entry point into the materiality of, of what you're doing. Um, so to kind of pull back the, the curtain. Um, and so others are introducing glitches into software um, you know, on purpose for exactly uh, that purpose. So I don't know, it's kind of like breaking the fourth wall or something. And, um, but in, in these cases, it's a way to really uh, examine the materiality of the digital objects that we're, that we're using. So. Yeah, I like to I like to reveal what back in the day we were called the hand of the artist, mm -hmm. uh, and and so uh, in, in quite a few shows you'll see um, you, there'll be a way to see the computer operators sitting at the computer. They become part of the show. If they're operating a, a puppet dinosaur, well, they're a performer. Right, just like just like anybody else out there. So why should they be seen? In the very first show that we did, the ad machine, uh, we didn't do that until the end. And then I thought, that's that's crazy. This guy was just sweating bullets back there. They're working so hard. So we, we took the camera that was on the offstage actors and turned it around and aimed it at the all the people sitting at the table and put it up on the screen. So during curtain call. <laughs> the whole crew just showed up on the screen, and they all waved, and, 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 and you know, did their thing, whatever. Uh, but since then, uh, uh, even in the magic flute, the, the screens would go in and out, and every time they went in and out, there was all the computer operators just sitting there at their little tables and working away. And, uh, and of course, with the, the stage hands, we, we formed a, a whole culture around our little Mozarts. Normally get no credit at all. Dell even gave them a name. The, um, German for 
for stage hand is something like Deutsche Dubenhagen or something like that. And, and so they're all listed in the program on top of that, that monitor. It's pretty funny. visualizations of historical places or archaeological sites. And one thing that's always um, bothered me about that um, is this notion that if we use a computer to reconstruct something, it's going to be more accurate or it's going to be photorealistic. And uh, what I like about your work, Mark, is that this is, this is theater. When, when your audience um, walks in and sits down, they, they understand from the get-go that it's, that it's theater. Whereas with these, a lot of these computer simul simuliza simulizations, as it sometimes called them, um, the whole idea is to, to um, it's kind of a pretense that it's, it's um, virtual reality. Um, when uh, I think sometimes as scholars we, we forget that it is theater. Right? It's, in essence, it is, it is theater. So, so I, think, I thank you. I wish that um, more of my colleagues who do this kind of historical reconstruction would, would recognize the theater in their endeavor. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mark.